the subject of this lecture is especially interesting because of the different connotation of uh, karma uh, in uh, this part of the world from the one we have in the east here when i first came to the united states in 1962 i saw people following eastern spiritual philosophy sitting down weighed down by the weight of karma that they were working out they were so sad long faces and i said what's going on here why are you so sad they said we are on the spiritual path we are working out our karma i got such a shock that on the spiritual path they have to lose their happiness and their joy and they have to make long faces and explain away miseries induced as well as natural by the name of karma i said do you know there is a thing called good karma also it makes you happy and laughter and do you know if one is on this path this is the biggest good karma and one would expect that one who has found a master and has come on this path would be the happiest person because of this excellent good karma you have found this how come after finding it you are having such long droopy faces and then i realized that the very word karma was being used in a different sense that we have karma with people which we are working out and it's all hard very difficult karma is action karma literally means action in fact there is a yoga called the yoga of karma the yoga of action lord krishna teaching arjun on the battlefield of the mahabharata at kurukshetra speaks of karma as the first yoga and he says no one can realize the truth who does not first perform the yoga of action unless one becomes a karma yogi one cannot have any higher learning the karma yogi is one who has practiced the yoga of karma action itself is yoga and in the gita in that talk by krishna to arjun he says in sanskrit yoga karma sa kaushalam which in sanskrit which translated into english would mean yoga is skill in action if you perform action skillfully you are a karma yogi you have done a wonderful yoga of action skill in action is real yoga but of course krishna goes on to explain that skill in action must be accompanied by no desire for results or fruits thereof that action for which we expect results and fruit is not yoga action without results is yoga action without results leads us to god action for result gives us the result if we do action expecting something to come out of it that which we expect which is a reaction to that action will come but if we act without any desire intention for reward it is as good as meditation it is step towards god realization therefore karma is not all that bad that we should get frightened of it on the other hand we also confuse karma with action in the physical body we say that was the karma of that man that he had to hit against so and so because his body hit against so and so but we don't hear of karma of the mind that that guy thought like this therefore he had karma of this kind both are of the same type in fact if the physical action is not known to us is unaware we are unaware of the physical action there is no karma karma comes into being if the mind becomes aware of what we are doing if the mind does not know what's happening there is no karma 
Now, karma, the law of karma says that as you act, as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you act, like that you will react. That there is a reaction to every action. And therefore, by human action, we are creating human reactions, and that human reaction leads to further action, and action leads to further reaction. So a chain reaction goes on from human action, and this provides the basis for our birth, rebirth, reincarnation in this world. That we can select a pattern of life based upon what we did in the past. The law of karma then explains why certain things happen to us in our life, for which there is no immediate cause available, and we say this must have happened in the past life. But the happening has to be in the mind. What is carried forward to the next life is not what happened to the body, but what happened to the mind. What is actually carried into the new, the new body is the mind. It's the same mind. The mind remains the same even when the body is changed even when we reincarnate. Therefore, it is the mental karma which we carry forward to the next life. There are three kinds of karma. One, the pralabdha karma, the karma which is coming because of past action. which is sometimes called fate or destiny. This is our fate. We couldn't help it. We must have done something in the past and we couldn't help it. It had to happen. The second kind of karma is karemaan karma, the karma of new action. That we are now sowing seeds for which we will find the fate karma later on. And the third is the sinchit karma, the reserve karma. The karma that does not figure in this life, because we could not take up all previous actions to fit into one life, what could not be fitted into this life and is held in reserve or storage for future use is called sinchit karma or reserve karma. All karma can be stored in these three categories. The karma of previous action for which we are bearing fruits and rewards now, the new karma for which we have to come back again to get the result, the punishment and reward, and the karma that could not be fitted in this lifetime, which is held back, which is reserve karma. The reserve karma we have not seen, and we do not know where it is held in storage. We will come to it later on. But these two we are dealing with every day. The previous karma leads to the development of this human body. It is said that unless there was pralabdha karma, fake karma, you could not have a human body. You can have the human body without any other cause, but you cannot have a human body without pralabdha karma. Therefore, even at the time of conception, when the human body is being developed and the soul is still in another body, at that time it is the karma of that soul which starts building up this body. The characteristics of this body, what face it will have, how it will look like, how it will behave, what will be the structure, is being developed through the karma that is coming up. While the body is still being made, it gets life before the child is born. And at that time, the soul has entered and left the previous body. There can be a time lag between the soul leaving one body and entering another one, but there need not be. I know of one case, personally, where death occurred in August in one body and birth occurred in the second body at the end of December. And that child remembered all the previous birth, and we could go back to the previous home and check the previous life and found that the birth, actual death had occurred in the month of August. That's when the transfer of the soul took place in the new body. 
But this karma, which has come from the past, we can't do anything about it. We have to go through it. It, is, it does not mean it is bad karma. It can be good karma, it can be bad karma. It can be neutral karma. It is just certain actions which are leading to a certain reaction. You get mad at somebody and hit him, that somebody comes and accidentally hits you. You want to punish somebody, that somebody wants to return the compliment without punishing you. But you get hit, you get a pain. It is a natural reaction to previous action. If you now act, you will have to do it again. But how do you know whether an action <coughs> taking place today is pralabdha or karma? Whether it is coming from the previous action or is creating new action? I was once lecturing in Detroit, Michigan way back. And after the lecture, a lady walked up to me and said, Ishwar Puri, can I hold your hand? I said, why not, man? Certainly. She said, no, I was afraid I might transfer my karma to you. I said, how do you know? You transfer karma to me. Maybe I have come all the way just to hold your hand. And if I don't, I have to come again all the way to America. What makes you think that this is a new karma you're going to create? I may have come just to, just to sort out this karma with you. What is the distinction? The distinction is very fine and very beautiful and is connected with the concept of free will. The law of karma would suppose that you have the right to act. How could you be punished or rewarded if you can't act? And if you can act, this means you have free will. Free will is essential for the law of karma to stay on. If you don't have free will, there is no law of karma. Therefore, the illusion of free will is used to work out the law of karma. When you feel you are free to act, then only can you create karma. If you are not free to act, you cannot create karma. On this principle, then we can distinguish between the karma of previous actions, which is a fate or destiny karma, and the new karma, which will create future fate and destiny. The old karma will never give you time to choose. There will be no free will, no choice. The new karma will always give you an opportunity to choose. Shall I or shall I not? Shall I or shall I not? And these options will be placed before you so clearly. You will have a hard time using your deliberation, contemplation, use of free will to choose that new karma. When you have no choice, it's old karma. When you have a choice and a deliberation, then it's new karma. But you may run into a situation where you have to act spontaneously. There was no choice. But later on you say, oh, if I had not acted like that, ah, I made unnecessary karma. Ah, I should have avoided. But later on saying, I should have avoided, does not make it new karma. It's still old karma. Because when the actual event took place, you had no choice. Therefore, if events occur in your life spontaneously, without giving you any time to make a decision between this and that, it's old karma. If you are thinking, should I do it or should I not do it, and contemplate and then make up your mind, it is new karma. But can we really create karma? Is free will real? Does man have free will? That's a larger philosophic question, but we ought to get rid of it right here. Otherwise, the whole law of karma will fall to pieces. We have earlier discussed the nature of God and said God is total consciousness. God alone exists. God is everywhere. God is all-powerful. He alone does everything. If He alone does everything, how can we have free will? The truth is, if there is a God who has His will, God's will, there can be no free will for man. None whatsoever. Some people talk of limited free will. Some people say, 
free will is like a horse tied to the stable, but he can move a little bit, but he can't get out of the stable. There is no real free will at all. If there was, there would be no God. If even the slightest free will is available to man, which God does not know about, he is no longer God. If man can take even one step on his own, and God does not know what step that man will take, surely that is no God. Man has become a rival, a competitor to God. But since God is all-powerful and his will prevails, therefore man has no real free will. One guy read my, heard my tapes and read some of the literature on free will and found out we have no real free will and he came up to me. And he said, I have found out there is no free will. The way he said, I have found out, I said, I will put him through a little exercise. So I got a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, placed on a tray, and I said, Sir, will you take tea, coffee, or nothing? Uh, now he began to think. I said, Don't use free will. Now if you select tea or coffee, or say, I don't want anything, you are using your free will. Whether you give an answer or not, you are using your free will. Not only do you have free will, you can't get out of free will. How will you get out of the situation? You will have to give an answer. If you don't give an answer, that is out of, out of free will. You don't want anything. I said, you are so sure man has no free will and I have destroyed that assumption in one minute. And he said he had read all the books and they said there was no real free will, but this tea coffee business he didn't understand. How with a simple cup of tea and coffee one can demonstrate that not only does one have free will, but one can't escape from free will. And every day, we stand on crossroads in life, where we have to turn either right or left, and nobody can say, well, I don't know whether I'll turn right or left, there's no free will. You have to decide. If you don't decide, that non-decision is also out of your free will. This, these are two absolutely contradictory positions. On the one hand, we say, if God is there, then can there be no free will. On the other hand, in simple tea and coffee, <clears throat> we are proving that there is free will. What is the truth of the matter? The truth is that there is the illusion of free will, the feeling of free will, but no real free will. The truth is that the man who is going to choose tea or coffee, he is going to choose freely from what might be described as the factors of choice built into his brain. He must go by something, then he will freely choose. He freely says, I want tea. Maybe his forefathers drank tea, maybe he got accustomed to tea, maybe his friends have told him about tea. There will be several factors leading him to freely choose tea. But all the factors of choice can be classified into hereditary factors, which he brought at birth, and environmental factors which he has picked up since then. If I could feed all those hereditary factors and environmental factors into a computer, before he can tell me what he will take, computer will tell me he'll take tea only. Freely, free will. If the computer can tell me what he will do out of free will, what free will is it? And surprisingly, at the moment of every choice making, all the factors of choice, both hereditary and environmental, are already fixed. You can neither change your birth nor can you change your environment through which you have passed. When the factors of choice are completely fixed, your choice is completely fixed. You will freely choose only that which you have to choose out of these factors. And why does it look like free will? It looks like free will because we are unaware of the factors of choice. If we became aware how we choose, we would know we have no free will. Since we don't know how we are choosing and the mind does not tell us all the factors of choice which remain in the subconscious, we say it is free will. Therefore, free will is an experience in illusion. There is no real free will, but there is the experience of free will. There is the illusion of free will. In truth, all those factors of choice have been fixed by God. He alone decided where we will be born, 
We alone decided where we'll stay. The moment we are born, our entire course of action is determined from that point. And we did not decide choose where to be born. Therefore, it's God's will alone which is creating the illusion of free will. Man does not know it's God's will. Therefore, he thinks it is his free will. God's will is the will in knowledge. Man's will is the will in ignorance. God's free will is real. Man's free will is an illusion. But the illusion of free will creates karma. Then karma must also be an illusion. It is. The karma is an illusion that lasts as long as the illusion of free will lasts. So long as a human being thinks he can act freely out of his free will, till that moment only there is the law of karma. When consciousness transcends the mental plane in which the illusion of free will is created, both the illusions of free will as well as karma disappear. We find there was neither free will nor karma. Only at the mental level and below, causal, astral and physical level, only in these three levels do we have the experience of free will and of karma. Above the causal level, there is neither free will nor karma. They both go together. You cannot have the illusion of free will and not have karma. And you cannot have karma without having the illusion of free will. And if one disappears, the other must disappear at the same time. So, in the state in which we are now living, we are under the illusion of free will as well as the illusion of karma. So, karma ultimately is an illusion. Illusion created by the mind. But the illusion works so beautifully, it sustains the entire illusion of time. Karma operates only in time, space and causation. Therefore, it's a mental activity. There is no karma of the mind, of the soul. Karma is only of the mind. The impressions carried on the mind through karma are called samskars. Samskars literally mean impressions on the mind. These impressions are the ones that engrave the next set of impressions. So the mind uses previous experience and the memory of previous experience to create new experience. The entire process is mental, not spiritual. Karma has nothing to do with the soul. Karma has nothing to do with God and the higher forms of realization and awareness. Karma drops down when we transcend the mind. Karma is a function of the human mind. Karma is a negative wall, part of ego. If there is no ego, there is no karma. Then that gives a little hint to us about karma. How can we have a karma-less life? If one says, I don't want to be born again, what kind of karma can one do not to be born again? If one does good deeds, one will still be born again to get the reward. If one does evil deeds, he has to come back again to be punished. What kind of karma can there be in which you are not reborn, in, from which, through which you can escape from the cycle of birth and rebirth? That is the karma yoga. Karma without desire of reward. That's why in the Gita it was taught that a karma yogi is one who does action without reward. And that action does not have any reaction. How can one do action without reward? By giving credit or discredit for the action to one's master if one is one. That's again a very useful thing to have a master. If you have a master, you have a, a focal point, a gathering point, where all credit and responsibility can be shoved up. If one acts in the name of God, there is no karma. If one acts on behalf of the master, there is no karma. If the master is seen as the doer and not the ego, there is no karma. So the illusion of karma is sustained only when the ego is there. 
an egoless karma has no karma. It has no reaction. So people who are so worried by the law of karma will be happy to know that in this lifetime they can finish the karma. They can go through the pralabdha karma, destiny karma happily, saying this is what we owed to our own past actions. We are the cause. There's no reason to feel very sorry about it, feel very happy about it. We did something, you got the reward. We are just paying our accounts. New action should be in accordance with the will of God, not in the will of the ego or the mind. And there is no further karma. One just escapes. Not really, because we have forgotten to include the reserve karma, princess karma. How is a package of karma selected to make one human life? We have been doing so many deeds, this deeds, good deeds, bad deeds, all kinds of deeds we have been doing for centuries, hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years through consciousness, taking on different forms. We have been doing this for so long that so much karma has been stored up. How is it decided which part of the karma from which lifetime is picked up to form one package of what we call a human life? The selection is made by us. We select the karma. We say we are willing to pick up this group, this combination of past karma and then we form our own body and come in. And why do we pick up bad karma? Why should we pick up bad karma and get punished ourselves? We pick it up because if we picked up all the good karma, we won't be in the earth plane. We'll be in a heaven. If we picked up all the bad karma, we won't be in the earth plane. We'll be in hell. The qualification for entering this plane, earth plane, for, with a body, is to pick up a combination of good and bad which qualifies to be here, you to be here. Otherwise, you are either above or below. Therefore, we ourselves pick up. But we like to keep it little favorable to ourselves. We like to have a combination from our past karma, which should be such that although we are able to get the human form, but we don't want it to be so bad that we can't bear it. We don't want it to be so good we get away to heaven. We want to be in the earth plane. That looks funny that a person should like to be in the earth plane and not be in heaven. Why shouldn't one like to be in heaven? Now here, heaven does not mean where the Lord resides. Heaven is merely a level of consciousness at the astral stage. Hell is also at the sub-astral stage. These are all stages just above and below the earth physical consciousness level. If you do they pick up all the good karma, you'll be given a life in heaven. You live that life, die, and you go back again to pick up the other karma. You have to pick up the combination to come to the earth plane. Earth plane, the birth into the earth plane in the human form is supposed to be the highest form of birth anywhere in the universe. It is better to be a human being with this combination of karma than to be the king of the astral plane with all the joys and pleasures of that place. Why? Because it is only in the human plane that you can create new karma. It is only in the human plane that you can become a seeker of God. You cannot seek if you don't have the illusion of free will. The illusion of free will is not available to you in heaven. In heaven and hell and all other forms of existence, Insects and trees and angels and beasts and animals and birds in all other forms of living, all other forms of the manifestation of consciousness, you only bear the fruits of previous karma. Only in the human form, on earth plane, do you have the illusion of free will where you can create new karma. Only when you have the power to have new karma, when you feel you have free will, can you be a seeker of God. 
Only when you are a seeker of God can you find the secret path to God, and only then can you escape from the wheel of birth and rebirth. It's amazing that the human form, with all its misery and goodness, should be the highest from that point of view. The very highest form is the human form in which you have the illusion of free will, which enables you to become a seeker, which enables you to reach God. That is why it is said, the human form alone is a form which is in the image of God. If God has a form, it is exactly like the human form. All other intermediate powers, angels, gods and goddesses who may be ruling various planes, they have different forms, they are only getting the rewards, fruits of what they did. They can do nothing. They can't go to God. They can just enjoy themselves, finish the time and come back again. To start all, all over again. Therefore, the human form is a very great gift. It's the best gift to this continuous process of consciousness. To come and be a seeker. And this combination of karma, of good and bad, which provides the human form, is the best combination. There is nobody in this world who has only good karma. And there is nobody in this world who has only bad karma. They would be somewhere else if they had that. There is always a combination. The reserve karma from which we have picked up ourselves, is mounting, multiplying, because we can't pick up the whole of it. We just want to achieve a reasonable balance to get the human form. Sometimes the karma is so bad, we can't even select the human form. We say, all right, let us go down. Doesn't matter. We'd rather be an insect for a little while, get rid of all that coming in the way. And then we can get another chance. We'll improve and evolve again to human form and rise to Godhood. We go through the cycle. But the cycle is always established in a clockwise function, in an evolutionary way. That means, supposing we pick up a bunch of karma, the karma is selected till we become human again. It may be we will select a pattern in which we will say, all right, two lifetimes of a mosquito, a little time as a plant, maybe for ten years as a dog, twenty years in another form, and then we'd like to be human and have another go at it and try and get out. If this package is selected by human consciousness at the time of rebirth, the cycle, we will then first become the plant, not the dog first. First the plant, then the insects, then mammals, animals, birds, man. Man comes at the top again at the end. The human form comes to give you another chance. It's a process of learning, the process of evolution, process of growing. This is soul growth. This is growth of the combination of soul, mind, astral form. The whole of it is growing. It is not only the soul that is migrating from body to body. Mind is also migrating with the soul. The astral body is also migrating with the soul. The astral body has a much longer life than the physical body. With one astral body, we may go through ten forms. Therefore, the whole complex is migrating from body to body. And as we select a package till the next human form, we leave a lot of things. We look back on our own karma and we select from there and we leave the rest and it's all held in reserve. The angel of death is quite happy at the system at which we pick up. He doesn't say, oh, take a few more bad karmas, why you are going off very lightly? He doesn't say that. It doesn't matter. Have some good time there, come back again. He's happy because you keep on coming and going. If you decide to take away all the bad karmas, or all the karmas and sort them out very fast, he'll say, this fellow, this, this soul is going to escape from my net. So he's not worried. Doesn't matter. Take it easy. You have enough time. You can come in the next round and take up the rest of it. So we are picking up karma to take up these lives at our will and then we realize, oh, we gather so much, this will take millions of years to get rid of. We better get rid of some more 
So the judgment is made every time you go through the cycle. But what happens when you find a living master, God himself, who wants to give his grace to you by making you a seeker and to take you out of this network? If the master has consciousness up to the level of the causal being, the mental being, he cannot take you out of the cycle of birth and rebirth. If the master's awareness and consciousness transcends the mind into spiritual regions and totality, he can take you out of the cycle of birth and rebirth. A master who is one with God in the highest region, the total consciousness, functions on this, on this basis that he has to take his marked sheep out of the cycle of birth and rebirth. Therefore, when a perfect master, a perfect living master, one whose awareness and consciousness has reached the highest level of total consciousness of God, when such a perfect master takes us into his fold as one of his marked sheep, his marked sheep in that particular human form in which he has manifested, when he takes us as his marked sheep, he takes us out of this law of karma. He cuts off our responsibility and accountability to the angel of death who is governing this law, including all the reserve karma. He initiates. The initiation of a disciple, of a perfect master, does not mean telling him a mantra. It does not mean teaching him how to concentrate attention. It does not mean how to perform all those asanas, those various postures of yoga. All these you can read in a book. This is not initiation. That can all be read in a book. Initiation takes place only at the third eye center, behind the eyes. The perfect master establishes himself permanently in the third eye center of the disciple at the time of initiation and takes upon himself the entire accountability of karma. Thereafter, there is no accountability to the angel who is responsible for life and death and rebirth. At that point of initiation, all reserve karma is finished. Burnt away as it were. No longer available for rebirth. The rebirth, if it is necessary, after that, is only based upon the karma of this life. And if one is a karma yogi and does not perform any action except in the will of the Lord or the will of the Master, there is no rebirth. This is the last birth. Initiation is the greatest good karma one can have. Initiation by a perfect master, that means who has become God himself in his consciousness, who has reached total consciousness, to be initiated by such a one at the third eye center is the greatest good gift one can ever get. If there are prisoners in a jail, in a prison, and somebody says, oh, they are in a very bad state, a visitor comes there, they're all right, distribute some fruit to them. So fruit is served with the compliments of the philanthropic visitor. And the prisoners feel happy. That guy was a good guy. He came and helped us. He did a good deed. He gave us some fruit to eat. Another man says, oh, we, I want to give some good clothes to this prisoner. They have had a hard time. We want to reform them. He presents clothes. He said that was a very good guy. He did a good deed. But the real guy who does a good deed to the prisoners is the one who says, I am opening the lo lock of the door. Please get out, escape. You don't remain prisoners anymore. Therefore, there are a lot of people who are trying to help the, help the cause of human beings here. They are trying to make life easy for poor, miserable human beings. But they give things and keep the human beings in the same cycle, in the prison of life and death and rebirth. If anybody does a real good deed to humanity, it is one who allows them to escape from the cycle of birth and rebirth. 
and that's a living master, a perfect master. Therefore, the greatest good karma can be if you can hit into a perfect master and he finds you. All your preparation and seeking is rewarded if you can find a perfect master and he initiates. Initiation is the end of all karma. Only that part is left over which you are now dealing with or which you will now create for any one or two future lives. You cannot possibly carry on for more than one or two lives with that karma. The maximum you can do if you are really bent upon bad action, even after initiation, the very maximum can be four lives. You cannot have a fifth one. Four lives. You cannot have a fifth life. Therefore, initiation by a perfect master is the best karma one can have. And that ends the cycle of karma, burns away the reserve karma. If you are willing to do unto others what you expect them to do unto you, you will avoid new karma. You don't want to hurt anybody because they, you don't want to be hurt yourself. It's a good principle of avoiding karma. So the principle to avoiding karma should be followed even if you find a living master to prevent any further life. Keep in mind what would hurt you that will hurt the other person. But if you are doing something which you know will not hurt you and you do that to somebody else and he is hurt, there is no karma. Because karma is based upon the mental intention behind that action, not the action. The action will not be karma, your intention behind the action will be karma. When you deal with other people, the karma is created by your intention towards those people, not by the action. If your intentions are right, even if the whole world is hurt, you cannot have karma. If your intentions are wrong, even if you miss hitting the target, you still have done karma. Even if you have sinned in your mind, it is karma. But if you have no intention of sin, and what looks like sin takes place, in the physical body, it is no karma. Karma is what we are carrying in our intention, the intention of the human mind. If intention is good, and intention will be good if you do unto others what you expect others to do unto you. You can make your intention good that way and avoid karma. Then I would summarize by saying that karma is the philosophy of action and reaction. It's an illusion last as long as there is the illusion of free will of a human being. Both the illusions last as long as there is the illusion of the mind. When we transcend the mental regions into pure spiritual regions, all these illusions disappear. There is neither free will nor karma. While the karma lasts, we have to go through the problem of the karma, even if we find a master. The master has created everything. He is one with God. Therefore, he does not interfere with the laws of nature. He himself has created he will allow you to go through problems. But if it is very hard, and out of love, he looks at you with compassion, because masters are full of compassion, God is also full of compassion, and masters are God are one. When they look at you with compassion, they make it easy for you to go through that pralabdha, while still keeping the angel of death happy. Well, this guy is going through, it doesn't matter. Well, you had to give him a big trick, and I'm going to give him a little small. They make it easy. They say, well, you have to be hanged, they may just give you a little cut on the finger, something like this. They will make it bearable. Even pranabda of the past life becomes bearable, out of compassion. If you do actions in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Master, Master does it, I am not the doer at all, and finish your ego, there can be no further karma. This is then the way to escape from the cycle of birth and rebirth, and escape from the clutches of karma. Thank you. Any immediate questions? Yes. I have a two-pronged question. Uh, 
There are many mystical philosophies that maintain that once one sees human form, he never goes back into lower form. I'd like to maybe comment and amplify on that. And the next part of my question is, uh, is it possible after receiving initiation by a perfect master to go into the endless form? Answer to the first uh, part of the question, which the Lord Himself dwells and acts in will, expressing Himself through the free will of man. Why should that man go down to any lower form? It is interpreted that he cannot go down. He can, he need not. It's not necessary. If you come to human form, it's not necessary to go lower, lower down. You can continue to be human thereafter. Unless you act like a beast, then you go and become a beast. If you act like a man, you remain a man. Then you don't become beast. So the second part of your question, if you are initiated, the question of going back into a lower form does not arise. Because every subsequent form will be better than the form you have taken, not worse. Even the human life will be better. It will not happen that the life in which you are initiated has a certain amount of pain and pleasure co combination. The next one will have more pleasure combination. It will always be happier and better life. So in other words, you would, you would not be initiated at a time when you had a, a, a karmic mode that was drawing you back. You won't be initiated at that life, at that point. Right. Yes. Uh, no is one thing and realize is another thing. If you have realized a higher level of consciousness, you don't come down at all. You don't have karma again. But if you merely know sitting here, there is something higher, but the ego is still there saying, okay, I'll try and find it out. Then you have to go through the cycle of karma. You don't have to come back if you actually go beyond the mind. No question of coming back to karma. Yes, just for that reason. Just as a savior, no other purpose. There's always a savior in the world. As a system. Otherwise, how would we go back? God is perfection. Why do we have imperfection? We have the imperfection of the negative karma to be able to realize and experience the perfection of God. The, the word perfection, the experience of perfection would not be there if we didn't go through the illusion of imperfection. Since experience itself is based upon the opposite, pairs of opposite. Perfection does not become perfection except in relation to imperfection. That's a mental construct. Yes, it is a mental construct, so is imperfection. Imperfection itself is a is a mental concept, so is perfection a mental construct. When you talk of God's perfection, it's a mental construct. When you talk of imperfection of division, it's a mental construct. We are trying to understand God's perfection mentally. When we are trying to understand it mentally, we can understand nothing in terms of experience except in pairs of opposites. Perfection is possible within perfection. Both are mental concepts. They disappear above the mind. But we are on, uh, this question answer is at the mental concept level. If you don't recognize karma, that means you don't recognize ego, you won't have karma. Karma and ego go together. If you are willing by some process not to recognize ego, you have solved the problem. There is no karma left. So long as the ego is there, I am going to do it. Karma comes from there. You don't have to recognize or say. You don't have to say, I recognize karma. Whether you call it karma or current or anything else. The moment the ego says, I am going to do it. All right, do it. You will be punished or rewarded according to what you do. You need not recognize it. You don't go through karma because you recognize it. You go through karma because you think you have an ego and free will. If you, if you are able to dispense with ego and free will, there will be no karma. But the only way to do that is to do that. That's the way. I know there will be other ways. You can tell me. I am only sharing with you. I am sharing with you what I do. There must be many other ways. I have never ruled out any other possibility. I will tell you an interesting thing. I was initiated very young by my master, about the age of 10. And uh, Professor Mueller has been saying this and in introducing me. And I distinctly remember his beautiful words which he gave to me at the time of initiation. 
apart from saying that initiation is not here, you have to go within to see where I've initiated you. He said, I am sharing with you what I have got from my master. It's quite possible this is not the best way, nor the way that takes you to the highest level of awareness. It's quite possible. If in the course of your life you come across any past, any master that gives you a better way or takes you higher than where I can possibly take you, don't come back to ask my permission. Immediately accept that and go ahead. Then come back to me to tell me so I can also go and accept that. That's the instruction to me. I'm carrying it out. I have spent 44 years after that searching for it. Any day I find something better, I'll accept it. Any day. But what is my experience in these 44 years? My experience has been, not only have I not found the shortcut which we were looking for, I have not even found descriptively, structurally, even in mental construct, I have not found anything which offers me more than this. If anybody has, I'll be very glad to share and accept it. I don't say this is the only way. This is the way I have learned and I am sharing with you. Go to the third eye center, you will see. There you find out. You must go there. The whole business starts from there. You must withdraw your attention within yourself, just behind the eyes. When the light shines up, you can see everything. You will see your past master. I mean the living master in the past form. You will see him there. Of course, you will see the present form of the master in his radiant, brilliant form at the same point. A beautiful experience. You get to know everything. You get to know what you got. But till then we are in the dark stage. That we must do. If we really want to check, verify, this single first step we must take, namely withdraw attention behind the eyes to the third eye center and see what's going on. You find whether you are initiated in the past life. Yes. It implies that I must have done some work in the previous life. Apparently, I did most of my work in the previous life. Now I do, seem to be doing nothing. Just talking. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do work in the past life. <laughs> <Quite right. laughs> You're right. Now, of course, I only talk. And one who talks doesn't know you know that. There is a statement by one of our mystic saints in India named Dika. He says, Dika baat agam ki kehen sunan me nahi, jo jane so kahe na, kahe so jane nahi. So Dika, though the story of the higher realms cannot be put in words, it's just not possible. And if somebody claims he's describing it very accurately what's going on there, he doesn't know. And if somebody knows, he can't speak. So I am the speaking type, you see. <laughs> I have said uh, many times, I have always believed there are eight types of senses, eight senses available to us, and I am a great advocate of the eight senses. For those who did not hear me describe those, I might mention five are the senses of perception, which are considered so important that people think the whole world means what we can perceive through senses. Actually, according to me, they are the least important. As a seeker of God, these five are the least important. Above these five senses is the sixth sense, which is called sixth sense, means the intuitive sense. Above that is the seventh sense, which is common sense. Which is an interpretative, interpretative function where you put things in the proper perspective. We don't start going for small details when we are looking for something big. Common sense, which is very uncommon, is the seventh sense. And according to me, the highest sense is the eighth sense, which is the sense of humor, the ability to laugh. I, I give very high credit to the ability to laugh. If I have any vision of God as with a form, I cannot help God sitting and looking in any other way except laughing boisterously. 
I can't think of a God who is sitting very morose and very sad. I have to visualize God as a laughing God, smiling, cheerful, joking, happy, wonderful. See, he shows he has got the eight sense. <laughs> 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 